Thank you very much, and thanks to all of you for the invitation to, uh, to be with you uh, today, as well as your interest in the Charlotte Housing Authority Scholarship Fund. I, um, I'm actually approaching 30 years of my involvement with the fund, and always pleased to tell the story that uh, Bill White, one of our former chairs, once described as one of the important ministries in, in the city of Charlotte. And what I thought I'd try to do in the next few minutes is uh, tell you a little bit about the genesis of the scholarship fund, share with you some statistics, and, uh, and then also share a couple stories on two of our students that I think will help give you a flavor for uh, the life-changing impact uh, this can have on, on the children that grow up in, in public housing where typically it's a one-parent household, uh, poverty level income. In most cases, they're the very first person in their family to ever, ever go to college. Well, the scholarship fund was founded in November of 1983 by uh, John Crawford. Uh, John's a graduate of uh, Johnson C. Smith University where he's uh, a mere basketball Hall of Fame, but in 1983, John was the Youth Services Director for Ch Charlotte Public Housing, and a young resident uh, named Victor approached him saying he needed $300 to be able to return for his final semester at Winston-Salem State. And John asked him what he was majoring in, urban studies, and said, well, what kind of grades do you have? He said, Mr. Crawford, I've got a 3.8. So John said, Victor, go pack your bags. I'll, I'll find the money. And that's literally how, how it started. John started knocking on some doors, started raising some money. Rolf Neal, the observer, wrote a very kind article about the creation of the scholarship fund. John uh, contacted what today is uh, the Foundation for Carolinas to serve as the administrator of the fund, provide the 501 c 3 status so, so the donations could be uh, could be tax deductible and in that first year uh, the first academic year would have been 1984 we had 16 students uh, in school and made total scholarship awards and $19,149 this year for the upcoming academic year 2013-2014 We'll have 103 students in school and we'll make the total scholarship awards of $165,000. Since our inception, we've made total scholarship awards in excess of $2.7 million. The day after tomorrow, on Sunday, we'll be having our 30th annual awards day uh, where we recognize our current students and honor our our this year's graduates. This year we have 70 graduates, which brings our total to, to 169. And uh, these kids have gone to schools all over the Carolinas uh, uh, and elsewhere. And uh, 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 we've had 15 graduates at you know, UNC Charlotte, 14 at Livingstone, 13 at Winston-Salem State, 12 at North Carolina a t 11 at North Carolina Central, We've had eight at UNC Greensboro, eight at Central Piedmont, seven at Johnson C. Smith, six at Fayetteville State, five each at North Carolina State University and UNC Chapel Hill, four at Appalachian State, and plus one or more at UNC Pembroke, UNC Asheville, Wake Forest, Meredith, Queens, Clemson, East Carolina, Western Carolina, Howard University, Benedict, Elizabeth City State, Shaw, Spelman, and Lower Ryan, and South Carolina State. What I think is really even more impressive is, is, is taking notice of the academic majors these students have uh, received. So we've had 24 with degrees in business administration, 13 criminal justice, 12 social services, 11 communications, 10 in political science, uh, eight each in biology, computer science, seven in accounting, six psychology, four each in chemistry and sociology, plus uh, one or more in elementary <coughs> education, history, English, theater, architecture, sports science, finance, physics, nursing, mechanical engineering, marketing, Spanish speech, journalism, women's studies, and African American studies. 
And as an anecdote, uh, Amy Blake, who was one of our early graduates uh, from North Carolina A&T in mechanical engineering, uh, has spent his entire career at the Pentagon and is uh, uh, currently uh, serving with them in, in Afghanistan. So we're very proud of, of the <coughs> quality of the kind of ac academic degrees our students uh, are, are receiving. The, uh, let me, let me uh, tell you a couple of stories about some of our students. Rochelle Thunderbird got her degree in 1988 from Queens uh, in Business Administration, went on and tried to get her MBA and has, has worked just since then in the, really the trust banking area, uh, administering uh, uh, pension prop sharing and, and 401k plans. And Rochelle, back in the late 80s and uh, 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 early 90s, was on our on our board and uh, asked her favor uh, if she would join me for lunch. And so we got to for lunch and I said, Rochelle, uh, uh, I've lived in Charlotte all my life. I grew up in an upper middle class uh, family, uh, great parents, brother and sister, never wanted for anything. I'm as Anglo-Saxon as they come. Help, help me understand what it was like growing up in, in public housing. And uh, Rochelle grew up uh, uh, with her mom, and they were in a, a duplex unit that shared a front porch. And uh, her mom had to work, so Rochelle's a teenager, and her instructions when she would get home from school was to come inside, lock the front door, take a chair, put it up against the, the front door, and uh, do her go to work and doing her homework at the, the kitchen table that was in, in that uh, first room. Now, unfortunately, their next door neighbor that shared that porch was a crack house. And <clears throat> sadly, uh, uh, on some occasions, an individual who was trying to go to that location mistook her address. And so her instructions from her mom were keep the door locked, keep the chair up against the door, and if somebody was trying to get in the door to dive under the kitchen table, put some extra chairs in front of her, and just start shouting, next door, next door, next door. And um, the, uh, that experience uh, made so clear to me the huge disparity between the child that I had and that of Michelle's and uh, uh, the things, all the things I took for granted, food, shelter, clothing, safety, transportation, the ability to participate in extracurricular activities and occasional family vacation, uh, expenses of school supplies, and so on. And it dawned on me that, that I had done nothing to deserve the fortune I had, just born. And Rochelle as well had done nothing to deserve that she had, uh, and that was a, uh, a rather sobering uh, experience uh, for me. Fast forward to 2002, Annika Baker graduated from Winston-Salem State with a, a degree in, in communications, and Annika was a very good, very good, bright student. She went to Garinger High School. In her senior year, she was taking college preparatory courses, one of which was calculus and, and you needed uh, one of these high-powered uh, 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 slide rules or calculators uh, as part of that. And they were $75 and her family could not afford it and she was too embarrassed to say anything. So she was rolling along uh, in this calculus class at the very top of the class and it wasn't until halfway through the year that her teacher um, realized during the test that she was doing everything by hand while the other students had, had their own, own devices. And so at, at that point made arrangements to uh, provide uh, uh, the, uh, the calculator uh, for her. And uh, over the last 11 or 12 years, uh, we have had in the fall a fundraising breakfast where we bring in a, a keynote speaker from the outside and we have one of our students graduates uh, speak. Well, in 2004, um, 
and asked Annika to, uh, to be our speaker, and our keynote speaker was uh, legendary baseball player Hank Aaron. And so Annika told this story about the uh, calculator, and uh, there wasn't a, a dry eye in, in the audience. And as she was finishing her comments uh, at the podium, I care if we're sitting right here, she looked down and said, you know, I guess I'm doing okay though, because one of these days I'm going to be able to tell my family that I shared the stage with the great Hank Aaron. Mm -hmm. And today, Monica is consulted with the National Park of Essential and uh, uh, is on a special project uh, with, uh, with Dow Chemical. And back in uh, November, my wife and I had breakfast with her at Toast, they were in, uh, across from Red Cross, and uh, just to catch up a bit, and as we were finishing up, she uh, uh, was telling us, with a smile on her face, but actually a little bit of a tear in her eye, that uh, she was so excited because she was in the final stages of purchasing the home, and she wanted us to know that it, that would be the first time in her life that she had ever lived in a house. So anyway, it, it's, uh, those are a couple of stories of, of uh, these young folks and, and folks and the life-changing impact uh, uh, providing this education can have, have for them. And uh, so with that, uh, uh, let me stop and see if there are any questions. And of course, I will stay after it. Uh, anyone has any additional questions, Faith Trees and Scott Cemetery have some materials. If you uh, are interested in learning more about the scholarship fund, uh, our uh, breakfast this year is going to be on October the 17th. Uh, Friendship Ministries Baptist Church on Baker's Fort Road. Hugh McCall is going to be our keynote speaker, and of course, we'll have one of our student graduate students as well. Yes, ma'am. Doug, how do you raise money? Uh, uh, fundraising breakfast is one way. Uh, direct uh, contact with uh, uh, corporations, churches, uh, organizations, individuals. Uh, historically, we probably raised 70 or 75 percent of our funds from, from individuals. And uh, so it's like any other uh, charity, we simply uh, uh, ask them. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, what, how has the, the impact of uh, tuition increase across the board at private institutions and, and state institutions uh, impacted your ability to award scholarships and to fundraise? Uh, that's a great question. First of all, the scholarships we award uh, are to cover what's, uh, what we call the need not met because these kids uh, qualify for Pell Grants and so forth. So for public institutions, the university system and the state, uh, the typical award each year is around $1,700. For a private institution, it's $3,400. And for Central Piedmont, for example, it's, it's $500. And uh, we have gotten to the point now where we are uh, uh, reached 100 students, and so that's going to continue to be a challenge. At some point in time, we're going to need to increase the amount of the scholarship awards, and that's going to be dependent on our success and ability to, to go out and, and, and raise, raise more, more money. So it will always be a challenge. We did uh, have a successful endowment campaign uh, uh, back in 2004 and 2005 at our breakfast breakfasts, our keynote speakers were Hank Aaron and next year was Dick Vitale. And that gave us a, a lot of visibility in the community and, and then we had an endowment campaign uh, with a lot of the major corporations. And so we, we built up an endowment now of about four and a half million dollars. So we feel like uh, we're in good shape to handle the hundred students going forward. Um, but John Crawford now wants us to aim for 200, so we've got to waste some of the money. And uh, that, that will continue to be a challenge. Yes? What does a student do to qualify for your help? 
the um, uh, sort of motto that John Crawford came up with initially for the scholarship fund was give the youth a chance. So to initially qualify, they need to be a resident of public housing or Section 8 housing. And there is no grade point requirement. It's just a requirement they can get accepted in a school. Once they're in the program, there's a 2.0 uh, GPA requirement to renew it each year because it's renewable each, each year. Do you do grad or graduate work also? We do not. Um, that's a topic that comes up from time to time that, that uh, we brainstorm, but uh, we, we haven't got that far along yet. Yes, sir. I was talking to a fellow Rotarian about going off to college, and uh, we each had had sons that uh, went off to private schools and were back that first year having just blown it. And I'm wondering how these kids do um, in comparison to children who come from middle class families. And well, it, it's, it's a real challenge. Uh, our graduation rate, in other words, students who initially qualify and graduate is around 30%, which is uh, in the same ballpark as the graduation rate of the consolidated university system for minority students. And we want to get that much higher, but if uh, uh, there are all sorts of issues that can come up, there might be a younger brother or sister that's got in trouble with drugs or mom's lost her job because of the economy and, and so on and so forth. So um, it's, uh, uh, it will continue to be a challenge to, to, uh, to try to uh, reach these kids at an earlier age uh, so they, they make better, better curriculum choices and so forth, better prepared to, to go off to school and, I want to add to uh, something that uh, Mr. Crawford, uh, that John Richards touched on, and identify that it is difficult a lot of times to reach our students, but we do offer a series of summer workshops. So it deals with uh, preparing for college, uh, networking, uh, planning, uh, you know, planning for your classes. So there's a, there are a series of workshops, and we generally offer about 10 to 12, so that they get some of that um, hands-on experience beforehand, so that when they go to school, they're not uh, totally shocked by the experience because it is a transition for any young person. We just had a partnership last week with Belk. Uh, Belk Incorporated did a half day uh, where they invited our students out. They learned about the retail industry from uh, you know the, own, the, the president of Belk on down to what a retail associate does, what a buyer does, uh, what the different salaries are. And they also had their human resources department uh, talk about how to dress for success, um, how to interview, how to put your resume together. So those kind of partnerships are very helpful, and that's why we like to go out and speak to the Rotary Clubs, because we're always looking for those partnerships to help our young people develop out those skills. I went to, fortunate enough to go to a New England woman's college years ago, and I just received the alumni magazine, and what they have done to um, bring in different points of view and a different student body is when they have reached out for students like you are working with to bring into an environment which would be vastly different than perhaps what they were used to in a high school level. They have um, a group and there's a success by, uh, by grouping. You know, here come 15 students who are in the same position and being integrated into a system that's a little different. And I wondered if that's something you have considered too, to help them be successful by having somebody, a peer with them, who is seeing the same challenges of, of integrating into a, um, a different community. Uh, we have not, <clears throat> but you just uh, provided uh, I wonder if I still have that magazine. I'll get it to you. Yes. Are you guys familiar with or working with the Charlotte nonprofit organization called My First Students? 
uh, first. Uh, is that the men's program? We, we do, um, there is a program, um, we're, we're located at the Carol Hefner Community Center, and there is a program uh, that helps young men get ties and suits and that kind of thing. So we are affiliated with them, and they do help them with the ties. And then as I mentioned, uh, Belk gave our gentlemen ties, and so yeah, we, we are tied in. But yeah, yeah we, but if you have a card. Yeah, they have training can. as well. This is the first time uh, urban students going to college. Thank you very much. We, we appreciate it. Before you go, we do have a little memento oh, thank you. of ours. So you remember us, have a favorite beverage. Thank you for coming.